what learn and undertake ever more complex motor schemes of action. You know, and one of the things that people think about human beings is that we're very good at thinking, right? But we're not just good at thinking. Like we're we're crazy, crazily adaptable in terms of our motor output. I mean, if you watch the watch the Olympics, you know, and you, you see human beings can do things that no other animal could even think of doing. I mean, we're completely crazy when it comes to the sorts of things we can do with our body. Like we're good on ice, we're good in the water, we can ski, people are really good at jumping, they can climb across buildings. Like people who train themselves can climb like mad. I mean, human beings are unbelievably variable in terms of their motor output. So that's another part of our intelligence that's not just abstract. And so, in part, that's because we have this very well-developed cortical area that enables us to chain ever more complex pa patterns of behavior together and also to develop patterns of behavior that are sort of outside instinctual specification. So you imagine with an animal that has a less complex brain, a lot of its behavior is going to be limited to those quasi-instinctual patterns of behavior that are devoted directly towards the solution of basic biological problems. But, you know, we can kind of solve those without too much effort, and then we have all this spare motor capacity left over, and people do the weirdest things with it. You know, and, and really remarkable, absolutely remarkable things. So that's, that's pretty cool. We're pretty cool that way. We don't get enough credit for it, I don't think, because human beings, if you think about human being as an animal, which, you know, people are kind of loath to do, we are definitely the most interesting animal. I mean, if you saw, like, a, what, a pygmy hippopotamus skateboarding, you'd think that was pretty remarkable, you know, but people, they do those sorts of things all the time, and, you know, we just take it as a matter of course. The lowest somatomotor neuron pools, the lowest level of the locomotor system, it's locomotion, and an action is formed by a subset of motoneuron tools. That's wrong. Motoneurons in the spinal cord ventral horn that innervates the limb muscles responsible for locomotor behavior. I dictated this with Dragon Dictate, and now and then it does weird things. Eh? So tools, God only knows where that came from. So a set of motor neurons in the spinal cord ventral horn, so it's way down in the spine, that innervate the limb, mus limb muscles responsible for locomotor behavior. When you start to think about the brain as something that moves your body, it's a lot easier to conceptualize the brain as something that's distributed through the body, you know, and your spine is actually quite smart. So even though in some sense you don't think with it, it's capable of very complex sensory detection and also motor mapping. And so um, mostly relatively automated and relatively reflexive. One level up, the existence of a spinal locomotor pattern generator. So this shows that the spine isn't responsible just for the most basic of motor outputs or sensory inputs. It can actually generate patterns. Is demonstrated by the fact that whereas a spinal animal displays no spontaneous locomotor activity. So if you <coughs> sever an animal, its nervous system, so it only has a spine, It'll just lay there. You know, you'd think it's paralyzed. That's what you would think. But coordinated limb movements characteristic of locomotion may be elicited when the limbs of such an animal are placed on a moving treadmill. That's providing somatic sensory input to the pattern generator. And so they've done this with people who are paraplegic. If you take someone who's paraplegic, and so they can't obviously walk, and you hoist them up, and you put them on a um, treadmill, and you lean them forward, their legs will walk. And that's spinal controlled. So that's what you're doing with your spine, you know. Because you're not thinking when you walk, you're, or you're not thinking about walking unless, you know, <laughs> unless you're one of those people who can't chew gum and walk at the same time. So anyway, so it just shows you how complex you are even at the, you know, the sort of the base levels of your, of your intelligence hierarchy. Level up. Locomotor pattern controller. So it's controlling the... Locomotor pattern generator. In contrast, undisturbed chronic hypothalamic animals. Okay, so now, one of the ways people figured out how the brain works was by sectioning animals' nervous systems when they're alive at different levels of complexity. So a spinal animal is one that's basically paralyzed. Its brain is separated from its spinal cord. But then you can separate the hypothalamus with the intact spinal cord, so it's one unit, 
from the cortex and even from the memory systems and even from most of the emotion systems and so the animal in some sense hardly has a brain at all you know, I mean the hypothalamus as you saw, it's a little tiny thing and everything that's on top of that can be separated from it and the animal can um, still act spontaneously so, so here's an example, if, if this has been done with cats and if you have a female cat and it's in a cage and it's only a hypothalamic animal it can basically manage, like it can't learn new things very well and it, it can't remember anything like it, it doesn't have episodic memory and so, but it can, it can maintain its temperature, it can eat it can engage in sexual activity it's got defensive aggression, like most of the animal in some sense is still there from an, from an input-output perspective um, it's also hyper-exploratory which is quite interesting, eh? because you wouldn't think, well, an animal with no brain is the most exploratory kind of animal well, it happens to be the case, as long as it has a hypothalamus so that shows you, A, how old exploration is, but it also kind of gives you some clue about what the rest of the brain is doing I mean, you, you explore new things, we'll say so what that means is you have to be able to tell the difference between what's new and what isn't and so what you need to tell the difference between what's new and what isn't is memory and so a lot of what the higher order parts of the brain are doing is basically keeping track of where you've been and so if you've been somewhere before then the exploratory circuit is basically shut off as long as everything that you're doing there is working and you need the whole brain basically to shut off the hypothalamus in some sense, that's how the thing works it's like you're kind of a default on system you know, your, your motor systems are ready to go and you're kind of you're alive and you're ready to go like a wild animal, but the cortex dampens that down and it does that by only allowing the activities that are relevant to that area and that might be none of them, to function at any one time so you take off the cortex, while well, the animal can still do a lot of things but, you know, its ability to match its behavior to novel situations and to learn new behaviors is very, very limited so it, it becomes hyper-exploratory, but it can't remember anything and it becomes very limited in the flexibility of its behavior and so, as you move farther up the hierarchy of complexity then you're able to do more and more novel and more and more complex and more and more situation-specific things